Hello, and welcome to Roundhouse Crosstalk, a podcast hosted by the California State Railroad Museum. What happens to the music scene when the railroad comes to town? And what can the changes in Kansas City tell us about the rest of America? Stay tuned as I talk to Dr. Gabriella Roderer about how Kansas City's cultural shift acts as a microcosm of larger American trends in the late 19th century. Uh, so a little bit about me. I graduated in May of 2021 with a doctorate in flute performance and a master's in musicology from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, and I actually started out there as, you know, focusing only on that flute performance degree. Um, but as I met the musicology faculty and was exposed to more of the, um, the, the beautiful nature of musicology, I realized that it's something that was really passionate to me. So I added that as well. Um, I would describe myself as a bit of an entrepreneur um, in the sense that my career is rather varied at the moment. So I'm a flutist. I'm a musicologist. Um, I'm also training to be an emotional release facilitator in the integrated um, processing technique modality. And I'm also a gluten-free baker and a couple of other things as well. So I've got a lot of different things going, but it all kind of comes back to um, savoring the human elements of life, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. Everything interconnects. Yeah. Um, could you define musicology for us? Absolutely. Um, so musicology, as defined by myself rather than an academic <laughs> definition, would be um, placing music in its um, social, uh, financial, um, and continental contexts. So instead of um, seeing music as being created in a vacuum by specific people, um, it is music being created within a culture, being influenced by um, things, by his historical events, um, as well as family influences and um, all, all those different contexts. Um, so what got you interested in specifically the history of music with Kansas City? It's a great question. Uh, so as a performer, as a flutist, um, I'm really interested in audience perception and audience experience. Mm -hmm. So when I got into musicology, it was a really natural and kind of seamless transition um, into the social, psychological, and cultural context. Uh, and so in speaking with my advisor, uh, she mentioned that focusing on a regional topic would be to my benefit. And as I thought about that, really resonated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so putting all of that together, focusing on something in Kansas City, finding um, music and the culture in Kansas City, I was surprised by what a beautiful musical oasis it was. I was involved um, in traditional classical music, so orchestra performances, things like that. But I was also part of a um, contemporary improv group where we use classical techniques, but we push them to their furthest boundaries and we improv. Um, and in both scenarios, in both performance scenarios, there were audience members. And that kind of took me aback that there would be such um, open, such open arms for all sorts of types of music. Anything anyone, anyone wanted to play, there was someone that would come and listen. Um, and so I was really interested in how that kind of musical culture could have developed in Kansas City. So then combining that with my interest in um, the cultural context, kind of put the two and two together and speaking with some really um, inspirational musicologists, I would say that the two that inspired my thesis the most would be Dr. Catherine Preston and Dr. William Everett. And uh, with their information, I was able to connect the growth of music to the development and the establishment of the railroad in Kansas City. Um, so what's just the scope of your research? What time periods are we talking about here? For sure. So the scope of my research is so focused on the influence of the establishment of the railroad on mm -hmm. the development of Western classical music culture mm -hmm. in Kansas City, Missouri, between 1869 and 1905. Um, so what is the historical context surrounding Kansas City as a railroad town? So what was it before it was a railroad town? Um, it started out as a trading post, essentially. So um, its placement geographically on the river uh, is really is a it's prime geographical land for any kind of transportation from one area to another. It's it's just perfect for that um, kind of thing. And the fur trader Francois Jusso Chautou, he established a trading post um, on the Missouri River in the 1820s. And so there was already this um, 
establishment of that kind of trading post in that area. And then we had actually, unfortunately, part of this story is, of course, um, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Mm -hmm. um, and with that act, uh, the Native Americans in that area, of course, were, and unfortunately, were forced to move out of that area. Um, and John Calvin McCoy and his father, Isaac McCoy, came to that area around that time. Um, Isaac McCoy was a Baptist minister, and his job was to help with the transition um, between moving the Native Americans out and establishing uh, good relationships between the settlers and the Native Americans. Um, but his son, uh, John Calvin McCoy, was really a kind of a businessman, and he could see that there was such potential with the placement um, this area on the river of connecting to like the Santa Fe Trail and being a much more permanent type of trading post for that trail specifically. And so he established what we what was called Westport Landing. And um, then just up the river from there, it turned into a settlement which became Kansas City. So it was pretty small. Uh, before yes, the it was very small, kind of rough and tough. Um, there was basically a saloon and mud piles. That was basically what Kansas City was at the beginning. <laughs> and so did they have a music scene before the railroad came through? They did have, um, they did have music. Music was permeated culture in a very different way, but also in a very similar way um, then. Um, so, for example, we had... Um, Croissant Jusso Chotou, his wife was known as kind of a musical um, source in the area. So she would host parties and musical performances at her home. Uh, and they were all sorts of things. They were um, folk songs, they were more classical music, kind of everything there. Um, and then for Kansas City itself, there was some there was some music, for example, mm -hmm. bands coming through. For example, there was a uh, steamboat that would come through on the area. And the steamboats uh, always had some sort of band or instrumental groups that they would come and they would perform and that kind of thing. Um, so what brought the railroad to Kansas City? Why did it become the target for where it would expand next? So with the transcontinental railroad lines that were coming across, um, across the country, um, they were looking for connecting points to connect um, the West Coast to the East Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, specifically through St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were two towns, there was Kansas City and there was, so Kansas City, Missouri, and then Leavenworth, Kansas, and they were both vying for this spot because it was, again, it this prime geographical location. Um, it would require less, you know, fewer bridges, that kind of thing. And so they were vying for this spot to be that connecting point between the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, and so how did becoming a railroad town change Kansas City? Did it change it culturally? I'm sure it changed it economically. Oh, it changed it in every way possible. Um, part of the reason why the business elites of the area were so intent on procuring these railroad charters um, is because they knew that the future economic and cultural livelihood of Kansas City was at stake. Um, the fight for the uh, for the railroad was also a fight for relevance. Uh, they knew that if Leavenworth got these charters, Kansas City would just be bypassed. It would become a nothing, a spot on history, so to speak. Um, but with the railroad, uh, Kansas City developed from a cow town to a sprawling metropolis. Um, and this was, you know, in a pretty straightforward way, more people, more resources, more wealth, more opportunities, seekers. It changed the dynamics of the entire area. Mm -hmm. And did the demographics change at all? Like, was there a change in racial makeup, cultural makeup? I would say that there was some shift uh, for sure. So the Kansas City area and Missouri specifically was considered a Southern. So technically slavery was legal um, just before the Civil War. So the makeup would have been mostly Southerners moving into that area. Um, and then after the Civil War, there was a little bit more shift, you know, of course, with more um, groups of African Americans. But with the establishment of the railroad in Kansas City, what that brought in were, were immigrants of all kinds, all, all types, all types of people, people coming from the East, um, looking for that westward expansion, that West, West experience, um, mm -hmm. people looking to kind of make their mark on history. But also uh, when when Kansas City began to develop also as a cattle town, um, a place for the 
for the cattle to be shipped out across the country, they needed workers. And so that would also bring in people of all types as well. So I have this image of this used to be a little um, trading post and now it's full of all this hustle and bustle. You'd hear all kinds of different languages, people wearing different kinds of clothing and obviously different kinds of music. So what kind of new um, musical things started cropping up at this point, cropping up at this point? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So as far as music goes, uh, what really changed was um, the amount of music and also mm -hmm. what started to develop was this cultural obsession with stars and famous performers, mm -hmm. which I found to be entirely fascinating. What happened was um, the, the first kind of opera house in the area was the Coates Opera House. And it was established and funded by Mr. and Mrs. Coates. Mm -hmm. And they came to the area early, early on, um, just before the Kansas City won that final railroad charter mm -hmm. in 1869. And when they came, so, so to put this in context, um, Mrs. Coates was raised as a Quaker. So she's very high, gentle society. Mm -hmm. And she comes to Kansas City and she and her husband, you know, they, they book a hotel room. And that night shots ring out across, you know, across the town. There's a brawl in the streets. They're sleeping with a gun under their pillow. You can imagine what a cultural a shock it was for poor Mrs. Coates. <laughs> um, but what their goal was, what Mr. Coates, what his goal was to, to create um, this financial opportunity for himself to, mm -hmm. to make a mark. Mm -hmm. um, and he understood that part of that was creating um, high level or high culture because mm -hmm. that would um, that would attract other people of wealth, that would attract other people of culture, people who wanted to stay more families, that kind of thing. Um, and so they funded the Coates Opera House uh, and again, it's this beautiful, magnificent opera house in, in the mud. There was not even like a, a paved road in front of the opera house. So the guests would come to the opera house and they like squish through the mud leading right up to the door and they'd have to wear like galoshes, and leave <laughs> all their hundreds of muddy galoshes at the door to go into the opera house. It was really quite an interesting cultural dichotomy. Yeah. And so was the opera house, was it successful? Did, was there an audience just waiting for that to come up? It was incredibly successful, actually. Um, and I would say that artistically or musically, I should say, the, the demographic was kind of split into two groups. So you have what I call the business elites. And I call them elites, meaning that they had extra funds to throw around. They had extra funds to invest in things. They mm -hmm. were not focused only on survival. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the business elites and then we have the working class. So the people who came in on the railroads, mm -hmm. um, who the people who were more transitory, uh, people working with cattle, that kind of thing. So you have those two groups and then um, Kansas City provided art and entertainment for both groups. So mm -hmm. the Coates Opera House would be for, generally speaking, not, not absolutely, but generally speaking, for those of higher, softer, middle and upper middle class um, residents, though in this period in the United States, um, the audiences that were attending operas, um, they they covered the whole social economic range. So you had the the top, you know, the Carnegies <laughs> of the country, all the way down to slaves, and they all attended the opera, which is something that was never clear to me in my understanding of classical music in the United States. When I learned that, I was taken aback. Why was why has this never been taught? That the opera is a huge integral part of music culture in the United States. That's um, so interesting that we've kind of lost the association of the opera with the American identity. Because I think most people, if they think of the opera, they'll associate it with Europe, like upper right. class, England, um, France, those kinds of things. That's really interesting. That has such an important impact on all classes of Americans. Absolutely. And for me as a music major in my undergrad and my master's, when we talked about music history and specifically music history in the United States, mm -hmm. we really didn't talk about music history in the United States until 1945. And it's around 1945 um, that the composers in the United States really started to garner this um, attention mm -hmm. uh, for the type of music that they were composing within the classical. Of course, 
I'm talking specifically about the Western classical music scene. Mm -hmm. Um, So I learned little to nothing about what happened in the United States before 1945, because um, it was seemed tangential Mm. to the main focus of the curriculum. But I have so appreciated expanding my perspective, my historical perspective to include the unscrubbed narrative. That's been very important for me. Um, So you mentioned that there was this obsession with stars and fame. And I love that for, you know, 1870s, 1880s America. Do you, do you have some names, some, some stars that people might fawn over on the streets of Kansas city? Absolutely. Um, Sousa was one of the stars. Um, He didn't perform. So we're talking about, this is typical quintessential American band music. John Philip Sousa. Mm-hmm. So you've got the stars, being, uh, the stars and stripes march, um, all these really famous marches. If you think of a famous march, it's more than likely written by John Philip Sousa. Mm-hmm. And so while he only performed um, in Kansas City maybe once or twice within the parameters of my research, so that's 1869 to 1905, um, his music was everywhere. That was one of the things that sold the best in the music stores in Kansas City, Mm -hmm. or marches and things written by John Philip Sousa. Um, Another um, would be Emma Abbott. Mm. And she uh, was a soprano. Mm -hmm. And she started out uh, with a a traveling opera company, um, and like a European traveling opera company. But she didn't get the, the roles or the experience or the performance time that she deserved or wanted. And so she decided to strike out on her own and she actually founded um, her own opera company. She owned and ran her own opera company. And she was not the only woman doing that. There were several women who were owning and running opera companies in this period. And what was unique or what set her opera company apart from these European opera companies is that she was what was called an English opera company, meaning that they translated all of the text, all of um, the libretto into oh. English. And it was something that they were okay with doing because it was something that happened in Europe as well. There were some translations of libretti going on. And so what she would do is she would perform and her company would perform all these famous operas, operas that are, um, performed on the daily today, but she would perform all of them in English. And that brought people in by the droves. She, once um, she traveled to Kansas City for the first time in about 1880, after that she was, she returned every single year and they loved her. They made postcards about her. Everyone knew her name. She was incredibly famous. Looking for more content from the California State Railroad Museum? Check out our YouTube page. We regularly post podcast episodes, special programs, and other video content. Hope to see you there. Right. Um, so in your work, you mentioned town bands. And I feel like nowadays we don't really have town bands, maybe smaller towns do, maybe in the South, in the Midwest. But as someone from Sacramento, California, this sounds very foreign to me. <laughs> um, so what is a town band? <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite personal discoveries of my research. Um, Basically, if you were a self-respecting town, you would have a band and a saloon, basically. But in, you know, facetiousness aside, um, a band was a mark of a civilized town. Mm. Um, So Raul F. Camas, he wrote extensively on the importance of band in the 19th century and um, he, in the United States, and he explained that the presence of a band was a status symbol. Um, And G.F. Patton writing in 1875, so within my time frame um, Mm -hmm. of the scope of my research, he said, "Uh, it is a fact not to be denied that the existence of a good brass band in any town or community is at once an indication of enterprise among its people and an evidence that a certain spirit of taste and refinement pervade the masses. And one more quote, William H. Dana is practical guide of 1878. He writes, A town without its brass band is as much in need of sympathy as a church without a choir. The spirit of a place is recognized in its band. Mm. It's fantastic. Mm. So you have bandstands. So these are mostly referring to brass bands. So um, in general, but they would be 
Uh, at every civic event, they would be at major performances. Uh, so if you were anybody that had anything, you would want a band at your party. Um, they would be, so Mr. and Mrs. Coates, they had the, the main brass band in Kansas City for a long time was directed by a man named Banty. Mm -hmm. And so he performed in the band, but was also the leader of the band. Um, and so he would perform for a July 4th festivities where thousands of people would be there. Mm -hmm. uh, he would also, Mr. and Mrs. Coates hired him and his band to play outside their home underneath their window. Mm -hmm. And they, then they opened up all the windows. And so a dance went on inside the house while the band played outside. <laughs> they were part of every major occasion. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's one of my favorite stories. There was this uh, article in the newspaper. It was the St. Louis a newspaper in St. Louis. And there was this young woman um, and she wanted to plan a baby shower because she was expecting, but she wanted this baby shower to be something of great importance. And it's hard to tell from this article if this was real or a prank or anything like mm -hmm. that. There's no outside information that I found at this point, but the article is just delightful um, because it talks about her plan was to invite every woman with a baby, I think under the age of two, to come to her baby shower party. And there would be competitions um, for the, maybe pull this up. So the most beautiful baby, um, the fattest baby, the prettiest baby, and the sweetest baby. <laughs> and all of those babies would win um, a bottle of Winslow's baby syrup. Ooh. And her, her goal with all this, I found this really hilarious, but her goal with all this was to make sure that the band was there to play because that was an important part mm -hmm. of the festivities and the planning of them. Unfortunately, this statewide, citywide baby shower never happened, but it does show us that if you were anyone, you had the band at your party. Mm -hmm. And was it always the same band? Um, there were a variety of bands. Um, like I said, uh, Banty, he um, and his band, they were the most well-established and the first band to be established in the area. Um, and this was about 1865. Mm -hmm. um, and they would be active for the next 20 years. But there were other bands also um, that would be added. As far as I could tell, there seemed to be a main city band or like a community band. Um, but my research only went, you know, cursory, cursory research into band, mm -hmm. uh, just enough to pull it kind of into the context of Kansas City. But there's a lot of great research done about bands and how they functioned in North America as well, the United States. And you may not know this. I'm just very curious. Did they have rivalries? Did they ever have like battles of the bands or anything like that? There were some other musical rivalries, if you'd like to hear about those. I would love to hear about those. Okay. Kind of going back to um, our conversation about demographics, so we have the upper and middle, middle and upper class, and we have the Coates Opera House and other opera houses that would eventually also be established, and the music kind of geared towards them. And then we have the, the more transitory um, working class, and they were looking for a different kind of entertainment, shall we say, um, deemed as inappropriate um, and scandalous by the middle and upper class folks Ooh. um so this was called this area was called the fourth district and it uh yeah there were several morally questionable performances that went on there Ooh. um but one of the the two the, the two main theaters um that were in the area they they would vie for attention and vie for audience members um and this would this would be late night performances. So we're talking 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight, those kinds of things is when they would be at their pinnacle of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened one particular night, um, because of this kind of rivalry and kind of vying for clientele and customers and audience members, um, they started doing a live outside advertisement. Mm -hmm. So one evening, one of the theaters, they strung a tight rope rope from one building to another, and they had their tightrope artist climb a, the, the tightrope in between buildings with a band playing outside underneath, trying to show off that their their acts at their theater were the most amazing. Oh my god, fantastic! 
I mean, we got to bring back, bring back that kind of advocacy. <laughs> I agree. It would catch my attention for sure. <laughs> the, the amount of drama is, is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what exact like styles and genres of music were considered the working class um, styles? Mostly vaudeville and variety performances. Uh, so you would, you know, this is kind of where, for the lack of a better term, the the, the term of like the, the circus or the freak show or that kind of mm-hmm. thing. It was more along those lines. So when I say vaudeville, we're talking about some instances or of, of blackface. So mm-hmm. minstrel shows, minstrel shows, mm-hmm. yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the affordability of these two. Um, different kind of sides of Kansas City. So were the vaudeville style shows, were they considerably cheaper than the opera? Was the opera prohibitively expensive? It was a little bit more expensive for sure. It uh, required more to put on to bring in the performers, often from Europe or across mm-hmm. the country, that kind of thing. Um, but as Kansas City developed, this most amazing thing happened, and it's really connected actually to the women in the area, mm-hmm. which I think is fantastic. Um, the more families that came to Kansas City, which is also as a result of the establishment of the railroad, because if you have that more money coming in, you have men who want to stay and settle versus mm-hmm. s- stay for a while and then move. So you have more women and children. And then as things progressed um, into the in 1880s and, and later into the turn of the century, you have more women entering the workforce as well. And in both of those cases, the women would start to look for entertainment outside of the home. Mm. And of course, you know, up to this period, most of the musical activity was in the parlor of your own home a lot of the time. That's a huge part of musical culture in the United States and in general. Mm. Uh, but if you're looking for entertainment outside of the home, that's an entire new piece of audience um, that these theater and opera managers could tap, could kind of tap and, you know, access and utilize. So what they would do is they would, they would, they started to um, amend their programs to become interesting to women and children. Mm -hmm. And so these, these theaters in the fourth district that had these morally dubious performances um, with these change in demographic and audience, they uh, slowly became less, um, successful. And so what came in their place uh, was more um, vaudeville, but with a slightly, slightly adjusted to, to appeal to women and children. Mm -hmm. Um, And also with that, um, because there was already such a strong presence of vaudeville in Kansas City, Mm -hmm. um, vaudeville actually grew to great success in Kansas City and women and children and men, of course, there were a lot of audiences. That is where some of the most um, successful and most popular performances were eventually were in the vaudeville genre. And and how could they alter it to be more um, women and children friendly? Did they just get rid of the more raunchy aspects of the show? Um, did they add new things? Right. It's a great question. So it was mostly not so much changing vaudeville itself as mm-hmm. much as adjusting the marketing scheme and also mm-hmm. um, some of the variety acts to be a little bit more family appropriate. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious about the racial makeup of this music scene. Were the vast majority of the musicians, composers, um, conductors, so on, were they mostly white then? Mostly, mostly Mm -hmm. white, mostly Caucasian. Um, There were a lot of women involved. Um, Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you you know, like, for example, for Emma Abbott, and there were a lot of performers, traveling performers that were also female. But in general, um, it splits again. So you mm-hmm. have a lot of white performing troops. You have a lot of white opera companies, um, but you also have uh, a lot of um, African-American black performers. Mm-hmm. And, but they would, be, they would be segregated for the most mm-hmm. part. So you'd have um, your African-American performing troupe and then you'd have your white, but they were both, they were both very popular. The, the, the amount of, or the number of, um, African American performers in the area. There were there were a lot. It was huge. They are a crucial, integral part of the musical culture as well. But their information is not as well documented. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, there was one performer. Um, she was the first African American woman to be a solo recording artist, mm-hmm. and she recorded with 
the main recording company in Kansas City. Oh, do you know her name? Yes. Let me just pull this up for you. Macy Hires, and this was in 1898. I found this information in the in a company catalog from the Kansas City Talking Machine, which is what the um, record company was called. And she was described as having a really rich and luscious voice. She was um, a contralto, it's a really, really deep voice. And it described her as having one of the richest and more beautiful female voices, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. It didn't assign any kind of color or race to that. It was just mm -hmm. one of the more beautiful women voices. Uh, but what's so interesting is the information that is in that catalog about her directly contradicts the information I found out about her in the Oxford African American Studies. They completely contradict mm -hmm. where she was born, um, who she was, <laughs> uh, because she she married uh, another performer and he had two previous children and they were daughters, mm -hmm. um, or girls, um, and these two sisters also had really illustrious performing careers. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the documentation, it, it, it confuses all three of them. And so the catalog was referring to this woman as her, as the daughters, but the daughters are, anyway, so it, it's, they're a huge part of the musical culture. Um, so you've provided us with some um, songs, some examples of yes. the kind of music that one would hear on the streets of Kansas City in this time period. Uh, would you like to play one for us? Absolutely, I would. Um, so the music that was most popular would be sentimental parlor songs. Mm. Uh, they would be waltzes, mm -hmm. uh, music that was four band or arranged four band, mostly in the intermediate level so that these community and civic bands could play this music. So that was some of the most popular music that was being sold. So what I have here is a recording. Um, so this was published by J.R. Bell, which was one of the main music publishers in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's by Dr. Frank J. Robertson, and it's called How Is Your Liver Today? And this is one verse from How Is Your Liver Today? And it's basically um, a sentimental, sad love song. That is one example of a sentimental parlor song. And I also have um, an example of a waltz. And this is called the Brewster Waltz. It's part of a three pieces for pianoforte. I have a question about how is your liver today? Yes. What does that phrase mean? How is your liver today? <laughs> what does that mean? Why would someone say that to someone else? <laughs> That's a great question. It was also what caught my attention when I was looking at music to use as examples. Uh, so basically, because it was only the first verse, um, the rest of the verses, what he's really trying to ask is how is your heart today? Um. 
because you've you've lost the one you love or, or something in that direction mm-hmm. but it's it's that kind of idea and asking how your different organs are when really it's how's your heart doing oh how do you feel on the inside yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so is this style of music is this um distinct to america or did this kind of music could you hear this in england you could hear waltzes in america for sure you also could hear um art songs Mm-hmm. Um, is what I would, what the term would be versus parlor songs, but in some ways they could function in similar ways. These are, you know, beautiful songs meant to be sung in the parlor or in mm-hmm. concert, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and waltzes, uh, you know, this probably the most famous of which would be the Blue Danube waltz, mm-hmm. um, which was written in Europe. <laughs> there are, it, it's definitely, these are definitely genres and styles um, that are not American based or based in the United States. Um, But they would then evolve to take on an Americana coloring. I definitely, when I hear this kind of music, I think Americana. Mm-hmm. I think of the aesthetics you see maybe at an arcade or at a boardwalk with uh-huh. the pinstripes and the Ferris wheels. Um, definitely very, didn't they call the 1890s the gay 90s with all the amusements <laughs> and the uh-huh. the music and all that? Absolutely. Definitely an, an Americana feeling. For sure. I think what we can see here with the relationship between the music and the railroad is how the railroad was essentially like the internet of the 1800s. Suddenly something that appears on the East Coast, you'll find it in the Midwest, you'll find it on the West Coast. We're so much more connected um, than we had ever been before. Um, Just bringing in all kinds of new cultural values um, and information. I think that is a beautiful way to explain it. That's, That's definitely how I see it. And what my research showed is that Kansas City in so many ways was a microcosm of the musical culture in the United States at the time. Right, so did the railroad ever negatively affect music in Kansas City? Did it ever stunt its growth? Not that I could find in my research, Mm -hmm. at least not within that time period. Mm -hmm. Um, We were, you know, the, in that time period (laughs) between 1869 and 1905, there was people in the United States, there was such the, so much change, so much growth, so much um, separation, so much, uh, so much chaos in the cultural and social changes that came from the railroad mm-hmm. um, that anything that may have negatively impacted musically may not have really shown itself until after. Mm-hmm. But I, but again, I'm speaking about strictly musical output mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, that's not to say, of course, that's not the full story. So there's all the, uh, the social ramifications, the, the, the racial ramifications, all of these different things um, that were very present unfortunately, in in that time. Um, For example, in the Kansas City directories, which would come out every year, and it would list, you know, of course, every resident within the town and also what their occupation was. Um, And in these directories, there were a couple of of common things that I would find that spoke to the complex and social nature of the time period. So for women, they were, it was always indicated whether they were a miss or a missus. Of course, Mm -hmm. all the men were always Mr., but the women had, you had to know if they were single or married. Mm -hmm. Um, And it always listed if a certain occupant, if they were Mm African-American, they wouldn't, you know, never say white. It would only list, oh, by the way, in parentheses, this person's African-American. And I didn't see in the directories any indication of uh, anyone from an Asianic descent. There was no indication at all, even though we're right in that period where the Chinese were, you know, an integral part of building these railroads. There's no reference to them whatsoever. So how easy was it for someone to decide, uh, for a woman specifically, um, to decide that she wanted to go into music. Is this something that would only be possible if she was upper middle class or could a working class woman decide, hey, I want to go into opera, I want to become a musician, um, anything like that? Great question. Uh, it would kind of depend on what genre of music they wanted to go into. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at classical music, Western classical music. So we're, we're talking opera, we're talking art songs, we're talking those kinds of things. Um, 
concertos, symphony performances, there was, a, as far as I could tell in my research, there was a little bit of that. that mm-hmm. um, and of course, generally speaking in the United States as well, carrying forward, this was always part of the issue for women is that there was that expectation to stay at home. There was expectation to raise the children. There was, you know, there was no separation of individual as a woman. But what I do know is that there were several touring companies um, in the United States in this period. Uh, If you were, if you're doing vaudeville, if you were doing um, some of the more, what we would call popular genres of the time, uh, you would not necessarily need as much social mobility or funds to go on that kind of life. And so how does what happened with the music scene in Kansas City uh, reflect a larger change that was happening in other American towns and cities? Absolutely. Um, I want to answer that by reading one of my favorite quotes. This was one of my research defining quotes and it's by Dr. Catherine Preston. Mm -hmm. And she says the following, she says, small towns and hamlets as as a result of the railroad Mm -hmm. um, being established in these towns, small towns and hamlets all over the country were now connected with urban areas and cities were linked with each other. This changed the country as theater historian John Frick put it from a collection of isolated independent villages into an interconnected national community. Mm -hmm. These railroad related developments help stimulate both urban growth and westward expansion, especially after the completion of the first transcontinental line in 1869. Mm -hmm. The expansion of the railroad system helped to facilitate immigrant dispersal all over the country, including to many of the new cities of the West. During the late 1860s and early 1870s, however, prosperity and growth were the national economic watchwords. Many middle-class Americans with increased disposable income were happy to spend it on performances by visiting entertainers. And so this is basically a reframing of exactly what you said, that it was kind of, um, it was like the internet of the United States, the railroad was the internet line of the United States. Uh, And with that connection to all the different kinds of musics and culture um, and funds, um, the entire country changed the way they were entertained. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, this is when you have the traveling circuses as well, um, all kind of in this period as well, but earlier, Um, but all of that, it's, it, it changed entertainment from inside the home to outside the home in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I've, um, I've had discussions with historians on this podcast about how the idea of regional identity has kind of chipped away at it. Yes. So it wasn't, you can only listen to this kind of music when you're in this specific town. Now you can access it basically anywhere as long as you have a railroad. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That could be one of the negative impacts of the railroad on music. Mm. Um, but for the, in, in the case of Kansas city, I didn't see as much evidence of that. It probably doesn't hurt that Kansas city was already quite small. Yes. When the railroad came through. It <laughs> might've been a different story if it had been yeah. a big story. Right. It could, it could only grow from where it was at. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and just my last question, uh, what is the main takeaway that you hope our listeners get from this? Absolutely. Uh, Just a couple of points. Um, What I would want or what I would hope listeners would get from this is that the musical history of the United States is varied and complex Mm -hmm. and often tragic. That Western classical music is an integral and crucial part of the musical heritage of the United States. Um, That musical culture in Kansas City in the late late 1800s and into the 20th century is a microcosm of the musical culture throughout Mm -hmm. the United States. And that... um, music composed by and performed by the typical masters is not the only kind of Western classical music that has merit. Mm -hmm. Then the music performed, taught, and adapted by locals is just as vital to fleshing out the entire narrative of musical culture in the United States, and in my opinion, the world. Um, Also, women had such a crucial role in making music of all kinds. Not only did they hold these crucial roles, they were trailblazers, they were leaders, they were business owners, and that they they were at the forefront of music making. And finally, that the railroad is a vital part of this history. Thank you for listening to Roundhouse Crosstalk, a podcast hosted by the California State Railroad Museum. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Goodbye.